Ladies and gentlemen, my name's Paul, and in the Shred Gaming Tech.com video, we're going to be discussing as well as analysing tech news, which, as usual, has popped up the past 24 or so hours. Hopefully, you're having an amazing day. I'm going to begin this video by discussing Zen 3, specifically the Milan server processors from AMD. There have been a couple of very interesting developments here. The first is that the favourable perception of Epic processors has increased rather impressively. Back when the CPUs were first becoming a thing, the perception of them was only 36% favourable, and it is now 78% favourable in 2020. Um, and this is, of course, amongst HPC users. And this is compared to Intel, which have just a favorable rating of 68%. So AMD are ahead by 10%. But the most interesting thing is a slide from Hardware Lux. I'll, of course, link their um, article in the description of the video. And they state, third generation AMD Epic processors, the new standard for modern data center, on track to begin volume shipments of our new next generation Milan processors with Zen 3 to cloud and select HPC customers this quarter, launching in Q1 and aligned with OEM availability. Naturally, these processors are going to offer a massive upgrade in performance over what is possible with Rome because, well, the Zen 3 enhancements that are pretty well established at this point. But it'll be very interesting how Intel can compete. As I've mentioned a few times now, um, Intel are just getting hammered in a plethora of benchmarks and perhaps the worst one being performance per watt. I mean, it's bad enough to be beaten in raw performance, but when you're losing in performance per watt as well, it actually makes it so much worse. But perhaps Intel can come back in the future. They do have some very uh, good architectures in the pipeline. But as I covered uh, a couple of days ago now, Zen 4 is also looking to be absolutely monstrous and is outfitted with a combination of DDR5 and PCIe5, much like Intel's future platforms, to be fair. But furthermore, the core count for the Zen 4 platform, the high-performance computing version known as Genoa, is going to go up to 96 cores, which, well, um, that's, that's a lot. That's a lot of cores. Um, but keeping on the subject with high-performance computing, another very interesting announcement from AMD is the Instinct MI100, and they are calling this the world's fastest HPC GPU. You might also know this as CDNA, or perhaps remember it from the codename Arcturus. This architecture has been a long time in development, and I remember reporting on this exclusively actually back in March of last year, where I mentioned that AMD were bifurcating its product lineup. It was going to have an architecture predominantly aimed at um, graphics, gaming, RDNA, and then back then I didn't know any of the details of this, just that they were going to be releasing a uh, GPU which is going to be aimed at compute based scenarios and of course this has turned out to be correct and we started to fill in the pieces as we were going and this GPU is indeed outfitted with up to 120 compute units which is well I don't need to say that that's that's a lot of compute units it's 7680 stream processors so that's 40 more compute units than the highest end uh, uh, Narve 21 chip and it's also accompanied with 32 gigabytes of HBM2, offering a maximum bandwidth of 1.23 terabytes per second. Unsurprisingly, it's keeping to the PCIe 4 standard as well. And AMD do claim that this architecture is going to have huge amounts of density, doubling that of the previous generation from the company. But also it does, as you can probably see from these slides and the videos that we've been playing, also have a rather different architecture too. Um, and it can offer up to seven times, about seven times, slightly under the AI performance, or, uh, sorry, nearly seven times on AI workloads. This is if it's using mixed precision slash FP16. But if you're using a GPU to GPU performance, it's up to four times faster. And this is 
again thanks to a combination of uh, architectural improvements infinity architecture pcie 4 all of this stuff in terms of raw performance numbers the t flops them are t flops fp64 is really high it's 11.5 t flops which may not sound that great but you have to remember that's double precision that is incredibly high for double precision um, FP32 is 23.1 T-flops. However, it sports what's known as matrix technology. So this means that the FP32 figure can actually go up to 46 T-flops. And the FP16, which is the half precision performance. <laughs> yeah, it's 184.6 teraflops. And also... Um, for those wondering about B float 16, it's just over 92 T flops. As for power consumption, they're stating that it's up to 300 watts that it uses, and the Infinity Fabric Links, which are times 16, are 276 gigabytes per second of bandwidth, which again is absolutely monstrous. AMD have also provided us a block diagram of sorts, and you can definitely tell it's a rather different design from what you would expect from, let's say, um, RDNA. This is obviously the first generation of CDNA. AMD has already confirmed that CDNA2 is way under, sorry, well under development, not way, not way under, uh, well under development, and overall. AMD will be offering a lot of competitive products across a suite of different applications and usage scenarios. As always with a situation like this, we're going to have to wait for it to become more broadly available. But it's very hard to deny that this is looking to be extremely impressive indeed. I also want to add that um, a number of RX 6800 unboxings have appeared although as of the time i'm recording this the embargo for performance um that type of thing has not lifted and it doesn't do so for a couple more days which yeah it is what it is um however interestingly hardware unboxed have revealed that they think that the stock seems pretty terrible um the stock situation furthermore uh, cap frame x um, video cards.com number of other people have all tweeted much like i've been leaking for several days now that the actual numbers of cards which are going to be available seems to be very low however to my understanding this situation will start to resolve itself late q4 and will definitely start to improve in early q1 nvidia from what i understand are going to have much the same thing um, I do understand that the 3070 is going to have a large number of ASICs available uh, coming into early next year as well. And also the same thing for uh, other SKUs like the 3060 Ti. At least that's what I'm told. Of course, NVIDIA, as of the time I'm recording this, have not formally even announced the existence of these GPUs. However, various uh, different companies have actually done oopses. Like, we've actually had uh, Inno3D, have actually had the 3060 Ti uh, listed, and <laughs> furthermore, they even had it on their website, which I imagine probably, um, let's say, slightly upset people in NVIDIA's PR department, but unfortunately, things like this are pretty commonplace. Yeah, so it, I, what I'm basically saying to you guys is that the stock situation is probably not going to be ideal over the next couple of months. There's also an RX 6800 XT benchmark on the Ashes of the Singularity database. In fact, there's a couple of them. Uh, this is courtesy of Tim Apisak, although has also been published on videocards.com. I'm not going to go too much into the results here because, honestly, the cards will have you know, pretty much all of their results leaked, well, sorry, released uh, very soon anyway. Also, the thing about Ashes of the Singularity is it's better for a CPU benchmark. Um, it's not quite as good, at least in my opinion. I know, you know, different people have different opinions on this, but I don't think it's a particularly meaningful graphics benchmark. And I would like to finish this video off with yet more confusion from Xbox, Bethesda, Zenimax, and the rest of the team. 
And this is from Tim Stewart, from uh, who is uh, Xbox's CFO. Now, there's not exactly a statement in terms of exclusivity, but he did state that they believe that they want the best quality version of the title on the Xbox, but they don't necessarily want exclusivity. So I'm going to read this out verbatim. What we'll do in the long run is we don't have any intentions of just pulling all of Bethesda content out of Sony or Nintendo or otherwise, but we do want what we do want is that content in the long run to either be first, or best, or better, or pick the other differentiated differentiated experience on our platforms. We will want Bethesda content to show up the best on our platforms. Yes. That's not a point about exclusives. That's not a, the point of where we're being, adjusting timing or content or roadmap. But if you think about something like Game Pass, if it shows up best in Game Pass, that's what we want to see. And we will drive our Game Pass subscriber base through that Bethesda pipeline. So again, I'm not announcing pulling content from platforms one way or the other, but I suspect you can see us continue to shift a better or first or best approach to our platforms um, yeah, that, that statement is really clumsy. I mean, even reading that is, well, yeah, it doesn't read particularly well, but, um, it seems honestly like they're not ready to announce stuff and they're kind of winging it a lot of the times with these answers. I personally feel that, that there might be time-based exclusivity. Um, that's kind of how this seems to be reading, like time-based ex exclusivity or maybe certain specific content. So, for example, maybe you miss out on certain missions. I don't know, maybe. I mean, I don't think they're going to deliberately nerf the content on PlayStation, for example. But does it mean that, let's say a game comes on the PlayStation, does it not get like such a good port? No, I highly doubt that. Instead, I think it's more likely what they're referring to here is that the actual uh, game itself will receive more content updates or perhaps launch with more missions or whatever on the Xbox platform, or more likely it's going to have a time-based exclusivity, at least that's according to this statement. But honestly, the whole team, like ZeniMax, um, Microsoft, they've all said slightly different variations of this theme and i don't honestly think they're ready to make formal announcements at this point and there does seem to be some level of hedging their bets um i i do believe though that there will be at the very minimum time-based exclusivity and it's interesting because phil spencer was asked flat out can you make money with the Zenimax acquisition without putting your games on playstation or nintendo and he flat out stated of course they can but that's also not a statement of saying that they won't release them on those platforms. So my guess is that it's probably going to be time-based exclusivity with some games maybe not coming to the PlayStation or Nintendo platforms. Then again, technically speaking, I mean, with the way that you can stream games anyway, it's perhaps slightly less of a big deal. that You don't actually have to own... Um, uh, an actual Xbox because of uh, X Cloud and that type of thing. So, yeah, it's a very ambiguous statement. I, I'm curious to hear what your thoughts are in the comments below because, really and truly, if you're spending that amount of money on a game studio, it seems really odd to me if you don't have any incentive for the gamers, the pe the people coughing up the money to buy the games to either go to your platform, um, or to be invested in your ecosystem. So obviously that can be Game Pass, or if you're gaming on the PC, Xbox, Microsoft really doesn't care. They just want that sweet Game Pass slash, you know, purchase revenue. Um, and I, I do think that there is obviously a reason for them to try and drive their platform. We know that the Xbox has just had a really successful launch. Even in Japan, it sold out. Uh, and much, of course, could be said about the PlayStation as well. It's not like the PlayStation is selling poorly. And I still suspect that the PlayStation in the long run will probably end up being the most popular platform just because of Sony's legacy in the gaming industry. But 
it's very hard to argue that this time around Microsoft are coming around to play and I find it really interesting that uh, Sony folks are really about exclusivity and they should be as well because you know games like Uncharted or whatever are amazing titles like I've I'm waiting currently to play on uh, Demon's Souls and uh, the new Spider-Man on my PS5. I'm waiting of course for the PS5 to launch over here and um, you know but of course, also, they're rather concerned that uh, the new Doom or, um, you know, Fallout game or whatever won't appear on the PlayStation format. So it's kind of, uh, it's a very interesting time we have in gaming right now. And I'm very curious to see how Microsoft to decide to play this because it's, there's a lot of, there's a, you know, we know Microsoft and Sony both have new studios allegedly that they're going to be acquiring. There are so many rumors about upcoming titles on the PlayStation platform, like, you know, a new Silent Hills game or whatever. So I think exclusivity is the only way really and truly that you're going to get people invested in your ecosystem. And it does, I feel, suck, you know, if you can't afford all of those platforms. Um, I'm very privileged. I, you know, I primarily PC game as regular viewers know I'm very privileged in that respect that I've also got an Xbox and you know I've managed to somehow or another wrangle a PlayStation it's not been sent to me by Sony or anything like that so I do feel very fortunate there uh, because I know many people just couldn't even get a bloody PlayStation pre-order and I think it's even more frustrating too because well yeah I don't need to tell you guys about the scalping that's been going on and you know I've seen uh, people been DMing me um, out of frustration though know, viewers that They've been seeing PlayStation 5s going on, um, you know, the normal auction sites for a thousand US dollars, fifteen hundred US dollars, two thousand US dollars, and yeah, I, I think it does kind of suck. So, this generation is going to be very interesting in the first, let's say, six, 12, 18 months. Anyway, with all of that said, thank you very much for watching the video. Take care of yourselves, and bye for now.